Hello, good morning. Welcome to Join East Desk. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokom Lemiri on DTT because we're free to work. Coming up this morning, special prosecutor directs closure of case against former Minister of State Charles Edubohan. The OSP concludes that even though he was found to be involved in influence peddling, his actions did not amount to a crime. We have details of the OSP's report of investigations plus some interrogation of whether a Dubuahin cannot be prosecuted. Also this morning, Electricity Company of Ghana says it cannot be blamed for last week's power outage. And as the government, governing NPP elects its flag bearer for the 2024 election this weekend, President Presidential aspirant Dr. Wuse Friakoto says he holds the key to breaking the aid for the party. By his warning, any attempt to subvert the will of the delegates will be disastrous for the NPP. We want to bring fundamental reforms into the NPP. We are not in a good place, and I'm the first to admit. Plus, Prosec Legon cements its place as undisputed champions of the National Science and Maths Quiz following victory over Chimota and Opokuwari schools to win the trophy for a record eighth time. Very excited about this. And it's very nice that you have worked so hard, you have put in a lot of effort. And you have also prayed to the Lord and committed everything to His hand. And He has granted us a victory. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Please stay for details. Many thanks for choosing us. Let's get down to the story. Special Prosecutor Kisi Jabeng has directed the closure of investigations into the conduct of former Minister of State at the Finance Ministry, Charles Edubohin, for corruption and related offences. Charles Edubohin was caught on video demanding huge sums of money to introduce some businessmen to President Ekofuado and Vice President Baumia. But after months of investigation, the OSP has concluded that despite trade and influence peddling, the actions of Charles Edouboahin did not amount to a crime. A member of the Legal Affairs Desk, Raymond Aqua, joins me in the studio with details. I mean, he's actually head of Research Desk. Raymond, give us the background that led to this investigation uh, of uh, the OSP into the matter. So you do recall that um, Tiger IPI, Anna Sarema, is this group in that do them investigations actually commenced this investigation in 2017 a result of mr Edubuahin. he was then a deputy minister of finance and the investigation was aimed at attaining whether mr Edubuahin was engaged in the perceived corruption and corruption related offenses that really is a problem in the republic of ghana what tiger ipi said to the special prosecutor was that they had received several complaints of bribe taking and also Several groupies had come to them and complained that the very institutions in the Ministry of Finance were acting in ways that were inappropriate. Fast forward, they finished their investigation. They did a report to ensure you know it was released, right? First, a write up in the ministry, in the newspapers. Then we all went to watch. You do recall, I sat by you in that particular place where we watched this sure. um, interesting one. Mm. When it was released, we were told that they had submitted a copy to the OSP and the other groupings to actually investigate. Now, it was at that time that the gentleman, Charles Edubwain, who was a deputy minister, and had been elevated, let's not get it wrong, this is investigation done in 2017, and was released later on. He had then been elevated to Minister of State, if you do recall his new position. Minister of State, which is now being occupied by Muhammad Amin uh, Anta. So he was elevated to that position. Mm. Then the president asked him, sacked him from the place, okay. then referred the matter to the OSP for investigation. Then the OSP was supposed to investigate corruption and corruption-related matters connected to the conduct complained of. So in a sum, 
the OSP then has to find the facts of the matter, then come to some conclusion on it. Mm. So what was the investigation that was conducted by the OSP? I mean, uh, the substance of that investigation. So the OSP had the responsibility of perusing the report that was submitted by Tiger IPI, as also complained of by the president, mm. so that they will get to determine whether any conduct at all of Mr. Dubuayen had any relation at all with the mandate, and let's not forget this one. The OSP's mandate is primarily to deal with corruption and corruption-related offenses. True. So whichever reference that has been made to it should sit within that particular space. Yeah. The OSP says, I did not only deal with Mr. Edu Boahen, all others that were named or named in connection with this report were equally called upon to come and provide some evidence after painstakingly going through the issues that have been raised and thoroughly dealing with the issues that have been raised, I called the individuals, I spoke to the other parties involved, and I realized that this was a sting operation, a sting operation by the investigative team, among other things, to determine whether the man indeed takes bribes or engages in the kind of corruption or corruption-related offense that we are talking about here. Mm. Then when I reviewed the data submitted by Tiger IPI and also engaged the people who are related to this matter, my conclusion was, not, was that the very responsibility I have as an institution, which is to find that the gentleman is involved or had done something that was involved in corruption or corruption-related offenses, could not be upheld. Mm. So what's the explanation by the OSP that no criminal offense uh, has been conducted by Mr. Dubois. Brilliant. So what he did is that he said, though the conduct of Mr. Dubois amounts to trading in influence or influence peddling, those keywords, trading in influence or influence peddling, which is closely associated with corruption. Again, as I stated early on, OSP's business is to investigate corruption and corruption-related offenses. But he says here, even though this is closely associated with corruption, there is no actual criminal prohibition of his act in respect of which the OSP has a mandate to further act. So that means what Mr. Adubwahin did, at least according to the documents and the report from Taga IPA and the one forwarded by the president, there is no criminal prohibition of what he has done. Mm. It is not a crime. It is not prohibited under any stated law. Okay. The very thing that he's referencing here, trading in influence and or influence peddling. Peddling. So that is what the OSP said. Then they moved on to say that on the reckoning of that, the special prosecutor directs the closure of this, um, at this time, mm. of this uh, investigation in respect of the allegations of corruption and corruption-related offenses. Okay. That's still the allegation. And, and Involving mm. Mr. Charles Edubwahin, contained, and that's the basis for which this is important, contained in the investigative documentary titled Galamse Economy, which was published by Anasis team. And he concludes by saying that there is no criminal offense conducted by Mr. Dubuain, correct? No, he says what he did was, it's not prohibited by law. I hope you get my point. Mm -hmm. So currently, is the belief of the OSP that the laws of this republic do not make this an offense that I can pursue him on in relation to corruption and corruption-related offenses. Okay, but I know that the OSP also talks about the fact that, I mean, within his terms of reference, that means that other uh, cr criminal bodies or other security agencies can take up the matter. That is where I bring in uh, lawyer Martin Pebu. Uh, he's a constitutional lawyer on whether there are other possible offenses that the former minister could be charged with. Mr. Pebu, I'm grateful for your time. First, let me gauge your mood on the OSP's conclusion on this matter. Okay, yeah, Aisha. The conclusion that uh, for now the docket be closed, for me, is not satisfactory. Not at all. You see, it's on the back of the definition that corruption means don't use public office for private gain or profit. So if we use that simple definition as sanctioned by our laws, I'm suspecting that they would say, that OSP would say that to the extent that Mr. Dubuahin collected 
veritable forty thousand dollars. That's at least about five hundred thousand Ghana cities today. As uh, what uh, shopping money, and we all know that's not shopping money. Actually, it's for a purpose for the role he was going to play. That's corruption. It's because of his public office he's been given that forty thousand dollars, and he took it. And so that's a private gain because when he got into Ghana, he didn't disclose it to the government for the government to take it away from him under gifts. So maybe if he thought it really was a gift, then as soon as he got into Ghana, he should have gone through official channels and look, I was given this gift. Let the executive say, oh yes, he can keep it. But to the extent that he pocketed that money, that's uh, benefiting from a public office. Don't use it for private gain or private uh, profit. So I don't see how we can say there's no corruption. No, uh, I don't. Mr. Kwebo, what are the specific provisions of the Constitution and what are the penal consequences uh, that uh, it attracts, if there is any offence, actually? Yes, yeah, so you see, that's there. You, know, you can see even from my address that I'm out of the country. I've been trying to get the amendments to the Criminal Offences Act, that definition. You see that recently we've done uh, amendments to the definitions of corruption, bribery, okay? So amongst them, we are taking the simple one that says that don't use pri uh, public office for private gain. Don't. So if you are involved in using your public office for private gain, I don't know what else it is. I wish uh, somebody said, uh, uh, maybe I wish this were done like an hour. Perhaps you are doing this later on, one hour later, we can read the provisions so that we analyze. Because for me, the key thing is that, and Mr. Javin is not running from it. Mr. Dubwahin took $40,000 in the context of his office as a minister of state. That surely will count for corruption. It is not just influence peddling. Listen, influence peddling is a very broad term. It encompasses so many things. So the fact that this, there was also the matter of influence peddling doesn't wash away or doesn't delete the corruption aspect. The influence peddling side was, oh, I will take you to see X, Y, Z. That's, uh, he could arrange to see the vice president and then the president. And even in that context, he said they should pay what? $200,000 to be able to see the vice president, right? So they, when you say something is influence peddling, it doesn't mean that that same thing cannot amount to corruption. Because what we are talking about is that he received $40,000. That $40,000 was because of who he is as a minister of state at the Ministry of Finance, and that he was going to organize a meeting with the vice president. And then apart from that, he had also negotiated a deal to receive 20% of the $500 million investment. So is that not, uh, a, uh, what do you call it, private gain? So apart from the 40,000, let's explain this. When you say gain, we are not, the money must not necessarily, that's the rest of the 20%. The, the 20 percent it must not necessarily hit mr dubois account before you say there is a, a crime no the moment you start discussing it the two of them plan when the two of them were planning conspiracy yes conspiracy the two of them that he would give the shake says i'll give you 20 percent then the dubois says no, sorry, the, 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 the Sheikh asked the boy, what does he want? And he says 20%. Yes, it's in that realm. So, so now that the OSP has exonerated the former minister, should the matter be allowed to rest? No, no, no. I don't think so at all. Far from it. And matter of fact, the debate is just beginning. Uh, today is what, Tuesday. I'm sure as we start pulling out the laws, look, let's have this conversation again 24 hours from now. Let's pull out the laws and read them out. As, as I say right now, I'm not in the mode of uh, listen, in the position to uh, access the laws. I'm getting fresh ones. Let's have this conversation tomorrow. Let's continue bringing other minds. Let's do further analysis. You see that, no, this docket should not be closed. I see corruption and see it clearly. 
it's not just influence peddling. Influence peddling doesn't end the matter. He has taken $40,000. By now, the first thing OSP should be doing is that they say Dubai should be directed to return the $40,000 to the OSP because before close of 72 hours. That's the first thing that he should be doing. How can Dubai uh, retain the $40,000? Are we serious? Mr. Jabin should be asking Edubuayi to return the $40,000 to OSP or bring it to OSP straight. And then let's go back into this docket. This is a clear case of corruption. It's not just influence peddling. No, let's get serious. I'm grateful, for, I'm grateful for your time. Martin Kwebu is a constitutional lawyer. Meanwhile, Chiraj Commissioner Joseph Wittal believes the passage of the Public Officers Conduct Bill will ensure corruption in the public space is curtailed. For 10 years, you know the Commission has been sponsoring the conduct of Public Officers Bill. Yeah. When we say there is no law, there is actually a bill that has been in and out of parliament for some time that would administratively deal with the conduct of public officers in areas that are not necessarily criminalized now the law doesn't mean that if it's not criminalized it's no law there are, there are, there are areas of the, the the law that need administrative sanction which can be as biting and even more effective than criminalizing that aspect of the conduct of a public officer and so this is the opportunity for us to remind government and all other stakeholders that look the issue of conduct of public officers in terms of the bill that is presently before cabinet is a very critical issue if we are going to fight corruption from all angles comprehensively Right. Um, so this this bill, uh, I, I'm guessing from your response that really that would have been the solution. Uh, if this bill had been passed into law by now, we could then have seen a prosecution for someone who, like you said, takes advantage of, uh, you know, a public office to, you know, enrich themselves. Not necessarily a prosecution. It can be an investigation that would lead to administrative sanction. Right. Under the bill, there is a provision clearly on trading and influence. And it's attended with a number of sanctions, including the removal as has happened in this particular case, mm. among others. But don't forget, the commission has also got a broad uh, mandate in, re in respect of corruption. So while the OSP may be limited because it has to deal with corruption and corruption related uh, provisions under the criminal offenses act, hmm. ours is broader. So we would not have, have stopped investigating this case because of a limited jurisdiction in corruption. Hmm. Military is reported to have detained eight persons from Garu and Timpane in the Upper East region after allegedly subjecting many of the youth to physical assaults of an alleged attack on their men on Sunday. Garu DC Osman Musa and Timpane DC Isako said the eight were selected out of 16 suspects after a screening and later airlifted out of the area for further interrogation by the military unit. This is after the National Security released a statement explaining their actions. Let's share with you uh, details of that statement. We'll be bringing you that later. Meanwhile, the Upper East Regional Minister Stephen Yakubo has been to the community to assess the situation there. Upper East Regional Correspondent Albert Sorry has been following up for us. He joins us shortly. Albert, what's the latest uh, with the regional minister's uh, uh, visit to the area? What were the highlights of the visit? Yes, yeah, so the regional minister, Stephen Yakubu, um, was in Garou yesterday afternoon. Uh, he basically wanted to get first hand information um, on the incident. Also, uh, see the victims, uh, those who sustained injuries and were in hospital, and even those who were discharged. He was also 
meeting with uh, chiefs of the communities um, where people um, were, were beaten. And so uh, basically he, he, he went there to give them assurances that, um, you know, what happened uh, would not happen again. Uh, because what he said was that they understood that many of the young men uh, and even the older men in the community were staying away from, the, from their homes for fears that uh, the soldiers could return. And so he basically told them that um, the soldiers were not going to return um, and attack them, and so they should uh, come back to their homes. He also um, promised that those of them who were in hospital uh, would be given some money to uh, support their medical bills. And um, so these this were basically uh, the things that he went there to do. Uh, he said that for those who had been arrested, um, he, he couldn't you know, just tell them that they were going to be released, but he was sure that once investigations were concluded on the reasons for their arrest, they would definitely return home. And, and how have residents been uh, responding to this? Yeah, so for many of the residents, even when the regional minister were there, they were still very angry about the incident. Remember, uh, sorry, uh, Garu is one of those communities or those areas where you, you rarely hear any sort of bad news. And something like this is very new to many of the residents who were angry about it. And so, for instance, there was a patient who uh, sustained a head injury and a chest injury at the same time and had to be transported, uh, transferred from the Garou Presby Hospital to the Tamale Teaching Hospital yesterday morning for further medical treatment. This is a patient who was not charged with any crime or even arrested. And for him to sustain those injuries for no reason was a source of anger for his family and even the residents of the area. It's the same for many of the people who are in hospital because they feel that they were beaten and punished for nothing um, oh, wow. at all. And so for many of the people mm -hmm. of Garou, mm -hmm. they are hoping that, you know, um, the government mm -hmm. does something about this, especially to take care of those who are in hospital, those who have had to pay medical bills for something that they did not uh, do to themselves. And so these are some of the concerns that the people of Garou had. Alba, sorry, is our Upper East correspondent. And definitely we'll bring you more on this in our subsequent bulletins. Let's get into politics. And flag bearer aspirant of the governing NPP, Dr. Uswe Friakoto, says he is capable of breaking the aids for the NPP in the 2024 elections. Over 200,000 delegates will on Saturday elect the party's presidential candidate for the next elections. He is, however, warning any attempt to subvert the will of the people will be disastrous for the party. Elton Brobe's report. Out of 958 delegates, Dr. Ousu Efi Yakoto pulled 36 votes in the Super Delegates Conference in August, enough to secure him a seat among the table of five. According to him, he went into the election hoping to make the first five. So our strategy was to make sure that we are in the five. And we, we are in the five. And this coming forth is a totally different ballgame altogether. Because we are talking about 20 times the number yes so how yes. do you respond to those who say that this clearly is a reflection of what is to come oh well i think they have, they have been it's a misjudgment but why do you think that it can change because the delegates down there are totally different from their leadership their leadership have disappointed them i'm very confident that those down there who have worked suffered so much for this party will take the right decision and that right decision is to choose also a free akuto as their flag bearer. But after engaging more than half of the 900 super delegates, he was shocked that only 36 voted for him. I fear the delegates, yes, yes. and that's true. Mm. But the thing is that for me, talking to out of the 958 who voted, at least I can say that I spoke to directly to more than half of them to convince, to, to, go, to sell my vision for the party and for the country. And I was very sure that at the end of it, they, they bought into my vision. Mm. At the end of the day, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So, uh, Uzo Efriye was right, that you fear delegates. But in the case of the 220,000 delegates, I don't think I've, uh, I've, been, I've interacted with even 10% of them. Mm. 
except that you rely on the structures that you build to get your message to, to them. But the insincerity of the delegates is not his only concern. The former Food and Agriculture Minister tells me the entire process was skewed in favor of one candidate. The reasons given by Mr. Tremartin for quitting the contest to start with before coming out to say that he's no longer with the party. Uh, those are very solid ones and I'm very sympathetic to those. See the implication of all this is the unity of this party. Mm. If we are, we are not seen to be having a level playing field, after 4 November it's going to be very difficult to unite the party mm. against the NDC. And for me that is my worry. Because if people feel that they have, been, they have, not, they have not been fairly treated, mm. how do you expect them to cooperate with, with, with the party after the contest when they feel that they haven't been treated well? For eight years between 2009 and 2016, Dr. Fi Yakoto served as a member of parliament for quite so in the Ashanti region. He was made food and agriculture minister when the MPP won power in 2016. During his six year tenure, he spearheaded a government flagship program planning for food and jobs. The son of the late Asante Hina linguist Bafu Akoto is counting on his strong roots in the Ashanti region to prepare him to victory. But he faces challenges there because the regional chairman, Bernard and Chibu Siakum, also known as Chairman Wun Tumim, has thrown his weight behind the Vice President, Dr. Mamadou Baumia. The delegates down there have no respect for the conduct of the regional chairman. And his impression that he creates that he is in charge of the, of the delegates will be proven on the 4th of November. Mm. Whether the kind of percentage that the, his candidate got will be repeated down there is still something that we have to wait for. Mm. But I'm confident that the, the message I've given to the people of Ashanti and to the rest of this country, the delegates know that this is the man. Dr. Fi Yakoto is hoping victory this weekend will help him reform the party and make it battle ready to win the upcoming 2024 general elections. This, he noted, would also enable him to have the mandate to pursue sustainable policies that are aimed at renewing the hope and confidence of the MPP fraternity. We want to bring fundamental reforms into the MPP. We are not in a good place, and I'm the first to admit and also the way the party is managed. We have a rules and regulations which say that if you are a party official, you don't define or come out to say that you are supporting this person or that person. Mm. And look at what is happening. The whole government, the whole parliament, the whole party, most of the party, people, uh, managers and so on, have come out openly to say that they support one person. And it goes against the rules. So that I, I alone should tell you that there's something wrong with our party. And for me, I'm very unhappy. For those who have worked closely with him, he is the best man for the job. Peter Otendako is a close confidant. Um, I would describe Dr. Kutu as a go-getter. Somebody whose words are sacred. If Dr. Kutu says this, take it as a contract. He means every word that he says. Mm. And Dr. Kutu is a very serious person. He is somebody who is an authority. If he says, let's deliver this, he will ensure that you deliver to the latter. Mm. That is Dr. Kutu. Elton Brobe for Joy News. Now get on to Zoom and pick the thoughts of political watchers on this development. Dr. Assassin is a senior lecturer at the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana. He joins us with more doc. First, what do you make of the complaints coming from all three contenders of the vice president in the upcoming delegates conference that it is skewed uh, in favor of the vice president? Yeah, Aisha, good morning to you and your viewers. I think um, you and I cannot doubt what they are saying. Because remember, those who are contesting, uh, uh, you know, true party people, their ears are on the ground, they have their delegates and all that. So I have no reason to doubt what they are saying. In any case, if you listen to, uh, you put your ears on the ground or you're listening everywhere, you realize that the party has been quiet with all these allegations. And for me, uh, that is a worrying sign. Uh, because from where I sit as a student of democracy, uh, I believe that the things that they are saying and others who are also outside the MPP bracket are saying, if care is not taken, then we are likely to undermine 
this democracy that you and I have fought for us over the years. I'm so worried. Mm. Come How to look at the issue of cor corruption that they are talking about, that using of money to induce people and all that. I am so surprised that up to date, uh, nobody has responded from the party to Mr. Kennedy Japan. And he is going ahead to dare them that if you don't do, if you do this, I will come out with this. this. He's saying a whole lot of things that border on corruption, where people are being bribed money here and there. Uh, they induce them with what vehicles and all that. And I am surprised that well-meaning people of the party are quiet and nobody says anything about this. I am also surprised that we have what very eminent people people in what positions of authority are quiet about this the osp should be interested in all the corruption thing they are talking about within the party he should be interested in not only that but of course the attorney general should be interested ghana bar association should be interested issue of what muslims what association a media muslim mission christian council all these this eminent group of people who were put together to serve a purpose for electoral commission where are they and all these things are being said what they are telling Kennedy japan and all those who are complaining are telling us that this is the situation within the party and you can say or i can say without your contradiction that it doesn't bode well for a meaningful democracy mm. a democracy where people uh, you know, now using money to bribe people is the way to go, as opposed to messages, as opposed to what issues. Then what type of democracy are we building? Are we firming this democracy? We are undermining the democracy. Well, Issue so of what? People playing ethnic card. So, some people playing ethnic card. So, some will say it's just an internal elections, but the bigger picture, I think, could be how dangerous this will be if the party does not address it, especially as we know one of them has had to uh, contest as an independent candidate because of same reason. If anything is wrong, it is wrong wherever you find it. It doesn't matter whether it happens within the MPP, it's intra-party election and intra-party campaign. It is wrong, I've been issue. So we must take steps to what address. We must talk about it and nip it in the party. Remember, the parties are those which, you know, grow to become what governments of the day. So if it, this is what is happening, all right, and we don't talk about it because we say that, yes, it's peculiar to MPP, then I'm afraid we are playing ostrich here. Because then what happened to the national one? They complain about issue of what? Intimidation. This is a very serious matter because come to think about it, whatever is being played out, if it is true and it comes to the national one, it's going to be what? Move to another level. Is that what we bargain for as a state? So this must what raise an eyebrow now and then we must move in to deal with it head on. Look at Dr. Koto, listening to him from your network talking about what? That there is no level playing field within the party. The election they are going to this is a serious matter and i am worried because these are the ingredients of free and fair election that there must be equal playing field for everybody to contest for election and all that so if people from the word go believe that the level flame field is not even then i'm afraid what type of results are we expecting from mm. the whole exercise uh, yesterday it's about the fact that the rules of the game are, are, are not being adhered to. This is a party that prides itself of being what? A democratic party, a country, sorry, a party as people who believe in rule of law and the rest of that. Why are they throwing the rules to the dogs? Listening to listening to one of them, um, Adai Nimo, yesterday, he spoke about the fact that if the party doesn't deal with this, it may affect their mantra of breaking the aid. I mean, what has this got to do with their fortunes in 2024? Oh, obviously. You know, when people believe that the whole system has been structured in such a way that it will go against the rest of them and to favor one person yes they went they want to wait for the person to win the election then who is going to campaign for the person who is going to support the person that is where the man is coming from 
that is going to be caused immediately after election. There are always what problems here and there. All that you need to do to be able to mend your differences and come back strongly to go and fight for the campaign. But if you have a broken home and there is no effort to fix it, and that when it's getting to election, you want to make what any move at reconciling people, I'm afraid. Then we go back to, uh, you know, Johnny Nash's music, that why do you break my heart? When, why do you apologize to me when you have broken my heart already? That is where uh, we, we, we are likely, that's the situation we are likely to face. I'm grateful for your time. Dr. Kwame Asasante, he is a senior uh, lecturer at the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana. Today, where to stay is on the Joy News Channel, your election headquarters. Let's get on to other stories. The Electricity Company of Ghana says it cannot accept blame for last Thursday's power cut in some parts of the country. On October 26, the Ghana Grid Company Limited, Gridco, in a statement explained that the cause of the outage was due to limited gas supply to Tema, leading to a shortage of 550 megawatts at peak time. But the Ghana National Metro, uh, Petroleum Petroleum Corporation, GMPC, which is responsible for the payment of services rendered by the West African gas pipeline company, WAPCO, has absolved itself of blame for last Thursday's power supply challenges. Managing Director of ECG, Samuel Dubik Mahama, on PM expressed, this, expressed disappointment over GMPC's handling of the matter, saying the press release was unnecessary. Conversations concerning WAPCO and GMPC, this is not the first time ECG has had to step in and bail, uh, what do you call it, GNPC out concerning WAPCO. Earlier on in the year, if you quite remember, the same time we were having these conversations with the IPP shutdown, IPP shutdown, the Friday that they gave us to the next day, when they didn't shut down, the next day WAPCO had taken the gas. ECG stepped in again and provided some good amount of money for WAPCO to, what do you call it, to turn back its operations. We managed it in such a way that nobody even felt it. Now, fast forward to this. I remember receiving letters from them concerning the, the, the payments and you haven't given us what is due us under cash waterfall. Every single person or every single entity under cash waterfall complains about not getting enough. But if you clearly see their bill is in USD. Mm -hmm. what, when cash waterfall is doing its denominations, it's in Ghana City. So GNPC, clearly, there's a plan for GNPC to make up whichever shortfall it is. Now, again, legally, ECG has no contract with WAPCO. So the CWM is a suggestive approach to making sure that GNPC gets something on a monthly basis, or even let's say on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, to pay these bills. What is sad in this press release is that they failed to mention what ECG did for them when this thing came up. What did you do for them? I don't want to sit, I'm not one to blame. I work with the tools that have been given to me. That's why I feel very sad and disheartened that this statement came out in the first place because I don't know what purpose is supposed to serve. Ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, John Jenapo, who is also on the show, is worried the lights may go off again if government does not make efforts to pay our energy sector debts, including the IPPs, who we owe so much. Uh, what is the tip of the iceberg? <laughs> what goes on the problem? If, if 20 million can plunge the whole nation into massive load shed, with a deficit of 850 megawatts, that should tell you we have a major, major problem. Look, as we speak, the World Bank LC has been overdrawn by $340 million. That becomes a debt for Ghana. Apart from that, the amount owed to ENI Vitol is $172 million. When you put the two together, you have a debt 
of $512 million. That is where the problem is. It's a value chain. It's, you see, the energy sector ought to be looked at from a holistic point of view. When you pick just segments and try to address it, another problem would arise. You are looking at sustainability. Are we going to have this again? Let's even assume you've paid WAPCO all their money. Does that resolve the problem? The answer is no. Because the raw gas that you are consuming, you are building huge areas, over 500 million. So if you can't deal with 20 million, then how do you deal with 500 million? Well, listen to Nana Amoisi, the executive director of the Institute of Energy Security, on how we can deal with the situation. I'd rather ask um, engineer to to direct some of the 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 concern to consumers like us, as well as those who still power and still expect CCG to function the same. I think it would direct it to. Um, government and their handlers to invest more into the grid system or the distribution system to reduce their losses and also to migrate from the postpaid move all the price to prepaid so that you have less work to do and you can even have your money in advance plus i also think that our communication within the power sector must be streamlined you don't know who is accountable to the consumer. And power goes out. At one point, you hear UCG sending mm. um, you know, a communique or an information out. Then, of course, you see Gridco coming in as well. Then today, we have GMPC. Who should we listen to? Who must communicate to the consumer? Nana Moise is executive director of Institute of Energy Security. He also spoke on PM Express. Still to come on Joy News Desk, Prosec Legon cements its place as undisputed champions of the National Science and Maths quiz following victory over Achimota and Opokowari schools to win the trophy for a record eighth time. Of course, coming up in business is Anodade Daryl Kwao. Very excited about this. And it's very nice that you have worked so hard, you have put so much of efforts, and you have also prayed to the Lord and committed everything to His hand, and He has granted us the victory. Hi everyone, morning after Presec won the National Science and Math Quiz for the eighth time. Uh, my name is Daryl Kwa, here at the latest business stories. The high attrition rate of salaried workers, especially public sector employees, is negatively affecting the rural banking sector's customers, leaving jobs default in loan repayment. Chief Executive Officer of Amansia Rural Bank PLC, Frederick Kwachiche, has revealed employees migrating from Ghana often leave without repaying their loans. He's therefore encouraging reassessment of strategies to improve their situation. Clinton Yabwa has more in the following report. The Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association, GRNME, has revealed that about 4,000 members were cleared to work outside the country. Similarly, over 10,000 teachers have relocated to Europe, according to the Registrar of the National Teaching Council. Chief Executive Officer of Amante Rural Bank, PLC, Frederick Kwachichi, said the trend has adverse impact on clients' loan portfolio. He was speaking at the 38th annual general meeting of the bank at Antwerp Room. Even three days ago, we had the president of Nurses Association of Ghana advising the government to regularize their migration. So certainly, those who were our customers and might have migrated would definitely have left out some loans, which are likely to go default. There was some kind of default from the salary earners because of the migration. So the bank is reassessing its strategy so that we can move to commercial and microfinancing so that we can increase um, commerce and then other businesses. For the salary earners, yes, those who are likely to stay, we will also extend credits to them. But now that the microeconomic situation is not too good, we are very careful extending credits to the salary earners because of their potential migration from Ghana. But we are in collaboration with the Bank of Ghana and other uh, state institutions to arrest the situation. 
The general meeting assembled stakeholders and shareholders to deliberate on fiscal plans for the future. The Amanse Rural Bank chalked some successes in the financial year, including recording an increase in the pre-tax profit of over 67.81%. Some shareholders encouraged management to remain committed to improving customer service delivery. Yeba annual general meeting, biara. You must see biara. You must board, no. Any or say management, no. I must be quite busy. Nani, a big boy bank, no. Ma, a tumpo, no. I must be a year, no. Ah, any or say business have a say. You must be a mama dear to say. Biara, you must be biara, no. I must be sure. Say ye, a bit to ye, ma. I must so a year, no. A tumpo. Meanwhile, the Amansi Rural Bank is celebrating its 40th anniversary in the rural banking sector. The bank aims to increase its shareholders and its social corporate responsibilities to improve lives in the operational areas. It has been a great success for the bank. We changed our name from Amansi West to Amansi Rural Bank, therefore bringing on board all the Amansi communities. And then also we have held a lot of... Uh, corporate social responsibility activities for the next 10 years when the bank celebrates its 50th anniversary would have put up a pavilion for the Antrocom town and then also construct other police ten cities and other developmental projects which will help the country Ghana and then uh, boost the name of the bank. The theme for the anniversary is 40 years of impacting communities through banking. Reporting for Joy News Clinton, Yeboah. And that's it uh, for business. We are taking a short break. When we come back, we're going to tell you about this story, how Presec won the National Science and Math Quiz for the eighth time. Do stay tuned. Welcome back to Joy News Desk and the Blue Boys. Prosec Legon has cemented its place as undisputed champions of the National Science and Maths Quiz after winning the 2023 competition for a record eighth time. They beat Achimoto School and the Pokwari School to write their names in the NSMQ history books as the only school to also win the competition back to back twice in 2008, 2009, and 2022, 2020. Max Walagwagwa has more in this report. The three schools came with one expectation to win the trophy. As they sang their anthems, the sound of optimism echoed within the four walls of the National Theatre. First, the gentleman from Upokuwari School. Achimota School. Undisputed champions, Presec Legon. It was a comfortable lead for Presec Legon in rounds one, two, and three. Things took a dramatic twist in round four during the true or false questions. Achimota School managed to close a 12 point gap to just three after the round. Achimota School with the same preamble B squared minus 4ac is greater than zero. <laughs> Kenneth? False. You are right. Maybe 
formed from the dehydration of lactic acid. Achimota school was back to losing ways and Presec back to winning ways during round five riddles. At the end of the contest, Presec Legon had 40 points, Achimota school 28 points, Upukuwari school 23 points. This is our 30th anniversary and so I am happy to also declare you the 30th anniversary champions of the National Science and Math Quiz. <laughs> oh, I wanna be all that here. Yeah, I wanna be all that here. Yeah, I wanna be all that here. This is the school I want her to go. Says they are happy at studios. Happy studios are we? At this point, we ask, are they studios? Yes, indeed, they've won this competition for a record eight times. So we can confirm that yes, they are studios. Are they happy? Yes, you can see the celebration in the background right now. I've now met Elizabeth Morty. Her son is Presec NSMQ 2023 winner Selena Morty. She says Selenam is living a self-fulfilling prophecy. Selenam's brother, Selassie Morty, represented Presec in 2019 but missed out on the trophy by just five points to Ogasco. She said his brother, Selenam, was then in junior high school prophesied that he will attend Presec and lift the trophy. He's a child that likes learning from childhood, even in his basic school. It's always first, always first, so I know you do it. And the brother too, contested in 2019. Oh, wait. Oh, really? Yeah. He was on stage in 2019? Yeah. Wow. Precept. He doesn't do anything in the house except learning. Mm. He likes learning very well. Wow. As, as a mother, what did you also do to support him? I'm sure you bought him a lot of science textbooks and all of that. He takes his brother's own, Celeste's own. Okay. He copies from Selassie. Mm. So while the contest was going on, what was running through your... Uh, I was first afraid. <laughs> you, were, you were what? I was scared. <laughs> it came to a time I was scared. During the yes. riddles, I was yeah. scared. When Atomata School was getting closer. I was scared, but so I was praying. I knew that God would do it. I told God that mm. he's been first mm. since childhood. Mm. So mm. now that he's coming here, he shouldn't be second. Wow. Yeah. I think God answered your prayer. Of course. Of course. What, what, what do you see him in the next five years, in the next ten years? Uh, Congratulations to the order. Yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wow. <laughs> That's how we wrap up the bulletin. I'll see you again at 12.